Okay, this is part six of the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund, with a reading and commentary on the work by Daniel, no, by Les Fisher of uh, Socialist Response to Antisemitism in Imperial Germany uh, as a State prior to the Weimar Republic during the period of the Second International and the faults therein. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go over to share. Okay. As we continue here, we come to Vistrich, as astutely remarked, that in actual fact, the Nair Sociodemocrat was, quote, as sophisticated as any of the publications produced by the uh, Eisenach Socialists, unquote. This is hardly a valid objection to Bernstein's line of argument, since its concern was with the sophistication of the publication's readers rather than that of the publications themselves. Bernstein's point was precisely that Hasselmann had made a manipulative use of Zer Judenfrage by presenting it to an audience incapable of comprehending its niceties. Yet, Wistrich's point is none, nevertheless well worth making for a slightly different reason. More so than a Naya Social Democrat, its predecessor, Schweitzer's Social Democrat, was indeed not only theoretically more sophisticated, but it also propagated a doctrinally more radical and, for the most part, more Marxist socialism than the publications of the Eisenacher. This was obviously a thorn in the side of the Social Democrats who needed to explain why the future had belonged to them and their closest socialist predecessors, even though the profile Schweitzer gave the ADAV while he was its leader, had in fact been ideologically more advanced. They sought to solve this problem by claiming that the ADAV had essentially been ideologically too advanced for the circumstances. <laughs> okay. Its leaders may have done, or at least said, the right things, but they had done so in the wrong place at the wrong time. This was a standard argument and by no means one that Bernstein needed to invent specifically to explain how it could be right for him to publish the second part of Zer Judenfrage, but nonetheless wrong for Hasselmann to have done so. Okay. Zer Judenfrage was subsequently also reprinted in the Berliner Volksblatt in October 1890, a point we shall return to. Against this background, the current scholarly orthodoxy on the matter is this. These were all isolated newspapers, and hence, by their very nature, hardly durable publications, unlikely to have a lasting effect. And it was not until Meyring's publication of the text in the Nachlashoglub Nach 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 in 1902 that Zer Judenfrage became widely available. There, it was imbued with the greatest possible respectability and prefaced in a way strongly emphasizing not only its significance for the development of Marxist thought, but also its validity as the basis for any contemporary socialist analysis of the Jewish question. Okay, once again, Meiring is portrayed as an exception, or at least exceptional, or at least partially crass figure. None of his peers, to cite Wistrich, so consistently took Zer Jugendfrage, quote, as his model and inspiration. Meiring not only considered that Marx's analysis was completely applicable to German society in the 1890s, he made every effort to popularize it in the working class milieu. This was in significant contrast to other leading German socialists like Kautsky, Bernstein, Bebel, and Liebknecht, who rarely if at all, mentioned Zer Jugendfrage and certainly never justified it. Unquote. Hmm. As we will see, 
this assessment calls for numerous qualifications. It certainly is true that Mehring thought very highly of Zeryudhanfaga. To his mind, the few pages specifically of the second part of Zeryudhanfaga weigh more heavily than the mountain of literature that has been written on the Jewish question since. <sighs> that was Mehring. Thus, it was quite indubitable that it would be most useful if the historical concept of the Jewish question established by Marx in his text became the common intellectual property of the modern working class. <clears throat> Unquote. It is no coincidence, though, that he referred to the historical concept rather than the text itself. For the text as such, beyond those easily understandable passages, the social Sociale de Democrat had warned in 1881 against the taking out of context, stood very little chance of any genuine popularization given the heavy young Hegelian baggage it came with. Before we turn to Mehring's role in the popularization of Zerjudenfrage, though, we should briefly consider this. Clearly, Mehring's contention that Marx's analysis in the second part of the Judenfrage was, quote, completely applicable to German society in the 1890s, unquote, or at the turn of the century, was ridiculous. Yet it was no more ridiculous than the already cited claim of the Sociale de Democrat in 1881, under Bernstein and Kautsky's auspices, that, quote, the development in the almost four decades since it was written has only confirmed its content, unquote. What makes all these claims all the more astounding is the fact that Marx's categorization of the Jews in 1843-1844 was never based on any form of empirical analysis in the first place. That's a condemnation in there. Okay, the portrayal of Jewry in the second part of the Judenfrage, in distinct contrast to the discussion of political and human emancipation in the first part, was based on a purely philosophical deduction par excellence that was void of all genuine empirical underpinning. It deployed traditional elements of anti-Jewish prejudice and mythology to generate a new variation on the same themes that generated that mythology and those prejudices in the first place. As Naaman rightly pointed out, the, quote, the huckstering of the Jews, unquote, for instance, quote, was neither demonstrated nor examined, but presupposed, unquote. None too surprisingly, the uses to which Zera Judenfrage itself was subsequently put followed the same pattern. Karl Bach is quite right, therefore, in stating that Zerjudenfrage gave stereotypical folk images an aura of social and philosophical respectability, unquote. Consequently, it turned prejudices, hates, and preconceptions of centuries of Christian and German nationalist advocates into empirical knowledge for Marxists, <laughs> and thus contributed to the modernization and secularization of traditional anti-Jewish preconceptions. Yet one would nevertheless be hard-pressed to demonstrate that Zer Judenfrage actually helped form or generate any of these perceptions in the first place. Okay, break time. <clears throat> Good, now we continue with part five. Here's another session, probably the last session for today. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> May Ring's role in the po popularization of the Judenfrage. How significant was Mehring's role in the popularization of Zer Judenfrage 
and how accurate is the contention that he played this role in significant contrast to the silence of the other German labor leaders with regard to the essay of the young Marx. Mehring's most substantial contribution to the text popularization was undoubtedly the introduction he provided for an edition of Sir Judenfrage, published, published in 1896 by the mainstream Polish socialists, the nationalist PPS. Aha, so that's the problem. Naman in particular took Mehring to task for his decision to contribute to this publication. and with considerable justification. On the other hand, it was only the introduction that Mehring contributed to this publication, and there was no indication whatsoever that his refusal to participate would in any way have questioned the decision of the Foreign Committee of the PPS, Polish uh, uh, People's uh, Party, Polish Socialist Party, Polish so Socialist People's Party, I think it is. <clears throat> the decision of the Foreign Committee of the PPS to publish Der Judenfrage. This particular popularization effort was undertaken for a Polish audience. It neither resulted from nor depended upon his initiative, and it transpired some six years before he himself published Der Judenfrage in the Nach Nachlasch aus Glaub. Yeah, Knowing the World or something like that. Okay, how about Poland? Uh, the, the Polish Socialist Party, you know, would have published it, you know, because it reflected their position that that Jewish uh, people were not really Polish, even if they've lived in Poland for 500 years, like my family did. <clears throat> and uh, recently, well, not so recently, it's been five years now, and still I haven't had a, an answer from the president's office, where it is now an appeal, <clears throat> asking for my Polish citizenship to be recognized with a, a passport even and that my parents be recognized as citizens as well. So, you know, in response, they said, you know, like, show us a passport, you know, an exit passport <laughs> uh, from Poland to verify that they were citizens, you know, but how were they supposed to have gotten a passport to leave legally, you know, when they were occupied by the Nazis? No way, they were in the underground. <laughs> there was even an underground member of the Jewish Bund, you know, member of the Polish government in exile in London. But, you know, they don't pay any attention to that. Okay, so we continue. The publica publication in the Nachlas of Globe itself was current, could certainly no effective means of popularizing Zer Judenfrage or any other text it contained. Not only did it offer a substantial amount of material unlikely to appeal to a broad party readership, it was also far too expensive to circulate widely among the membership. A fair share of the party libraries may have owned it, although no evidence to that effect has survived. Even there, it would have fallen into the category of titles least likely to be borrowed with any frequency. The Nachlas of Ausglaub proved an invaluable source for intellectually and historically interested members of the party elites and theoreticians throughout the Second International. Its significance is perhaps best demonstrated by the frequent use Lenin made of it. It was the main source for his understanding of the revolutionary strategy of Marx and Engels in 1848-1849, and the way in which they reflected upon it in a decade or so afterwards. This made the Naklas self globe highly influential in its own right, to be sure, but certainly no medium of popularization. <clears throat> On the other hand, Mehring did participate actively in the party a publish, publisher's popularization initiatives on a number of planes. Inter alia, he edited and prefaced, and in one instance even translated, easily accessible and affordable reprints of works by Engels, Weitling, Lasalle, Wilhelm Wolf, Labriola, F.A. Lang, Schweitzer, and Marx. Yet, Zer Judenfrage was not among them. Perhaps he would have liked to include it had there been the slightest chance that it might sell. Whatever the reasons, though, in fact, remains that he did not publish 
uh, a Vox of Glaub, a people's edition of Zer Judenfrage. The first more readily accessible and affordable edition of Zer Judenfrage, a reprint of the text published in Nachlass of Glaub, appeared in 1908 in Oster Waffenkammer des Socialismus. Hmm. On the what is to be what is to be happening of in socialism. This was a periodical published twice yearly between 1903 and 1910 by the Frankfurter Volkstimme, the Frankfurter People's Voice, with the express purpose of offering affordable collections of otherwise not easily accessible basic texts. It was presumably edited by, or at the very least under the auspices of, the paper's long-standing editor-in-chief from 1895 to 1917, Max Quark, hmm, 1860-1930, who was a revisionist and regular contributor to the Socialistische Monatschrift. Hmm. To what extent Mehring may have had his fingers in this reprint of Zerah Judenfrage is hard to determine. Whatever his possible involvement behind the scenes, though, the fact remains that the responsibility for this publication clearly lay with a periodical that he was not closely associated with and that was edited by, or at the very least under the overcome control of, a prominent and outspoken revisionist. Zerah Judenfrage was published there with only a very short preface. Although originally no more than incidental remarks made in the form of a book review, it explained the double essay that Mehring had made accessible again deserved more attention than it usually received. Well, we still have only very little literature on the nationalities and race question, unquote, it continued. <laughs> the race question, oh yeah. <clears throat> And it continues. Oh, yeah. Here's a little drink. And what has been written en masse about the Jewish question over the last few decades by bourgeois authors does not remotely reach the thoroughness and depth of Marx's discussion. He took, quote, the decisive step by bringing the religious question down to its secular basis and demonstrating why civil society perpetually creates the Jew from its own entails, why Jewry only achieves its consummation in civil society, as the civil society only achieves its consummation in the Christian world, according to Mehring. This significance of Marx's Jewish studies justifies the attempt to popularize them more strongly with the following publication. Mm -hmm. Tellingly enough, though, although Oster Waffenkammer reprinted the entire double essay, the one sentence the preface picked from Mehring's introduction once again paraphrased a passage from a second essay. But Mehring was not, of course, responsible for that choice, at least not directly, nor, for that matter, did that particular paraphrase misrepresent Marx or put any sort of specifically Mehringian spin on the matter. It is worth emphasizing that this particular Volksosglobe, which was in a far better position than Mehring's Nachlassovglobe to contribute to the popularization of Zer Judenfrage, was issued under revisionist auspices. After all, it has generally been claimed that the revisionists were at least marginally less uncouth than the so-called orthodox Marxists in their approach to anti-Semitism and the Jewish question. Consequently, the Socialistische Monatschifte were, for instance, prepared to offer a forum for the discussion of Jewish nationalism and other contentious issues that the Naya Zeit would not tolerate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is, in any case, a tricky line of argument for at least two reasons. Firstly, because there is an obvious point of contact between a desire to be rid of the Jews in one's own country and the apparent promise of the Zionists to fulfill that desire. Secondly, because there was at the time an equally obvious point of contact between even the most reluctant support for the Zionist cause 
and rather less reluctant form of enthusiasm for white settler colonialism and imperialism more generally. If one conceded that Jewish settlement might contribute to the development of Palestine, how could one deny the civilizing character of similar endeavors elsewhere? While the Marxists tended to reject Jewish nationalism in general, and Zionism in particular out of hand, some revisionists were indeed more inclined to give these aspirations a fair hearing. Yet for many of them, this preparedness had more to do with the desire to make their peace with German colonial ambitions than with their attitudes towards the Jews. But be that as it may, the revisionism the revisionism of Quark and his colleagues in Frankfurt, who were responsible for Aste Waffenkammer, obviously did not curtail their enthusiasm for Zer Judenfrage. Clearly, then, Mehring was not quite as peerless in his dealings with Zer Judenfrage mm -hmm. as has generally been suggested, nor can the contention be upheld that Babel and Lipnicht rarely, rarely, if at all, mentioned Zer Judenfrage, and certainly never justified it, unfortunately. Okay, so now we're going to Wilhelm Leibniz. Okay, that'll be in part six. Oh. To conclude in this part five, we can see how mixed up Marxism has been about, quote unquote, the Jewish question, which again is not a question. And it even came up when the uh, ex-comrade Trotskyist John Darling put out a list of readings for the ex-Trotskyist comrades of the League for Socialist Action and the um, Revolutionary Marxist group of Mandel. And the first item in his list was something about the Zionist lobby controlling the United States of America. So I pointed out to him that, you know, surely a Marxist would have better knowledge of capitalism than that, and that that was an anti-Semitic trope. And he didn't believe me, so he went and asked uh, two other second-generation Holocaust survivors, ex as well, and they agreed, yeah, you can't say that <laughs> unless you don't believe in capitalism. <laughs> yeah. So that's where Zara Jugendfrage has popped up its head again in the form of John Darling. Okay, leave that for now.